Welcome to Ageless by Rescue. This podcast is devoted to exploring the science of rejuvenation, uncovering the most trusted experts, the must-have products, innovations, and technology in the field of vitality, aesthetics, new beauty, and cosmetic enhancement. I am absolutely delighted to introduce you to an icon in the Australian aesthetics and cosmeceutical industry, Mr. Richard Parker. Welcome to Ageless by Rescue. What an honor and a thrill to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Bahan. Thank you so much for reaching out and for giving me this opportunity to talk to you on your show. We all love it. Well, I'm sure it was an absolute um have to have for me uh, you know I remember the first time I met you uh, as I was saying to you before we recorded after we finished all the business of things I thought to myself oh my god I just want to have a glass of wine with Richard and yes. and learn everything oh. that's in his mind about beauty because you mm. really have created a cult brand I would like to say and I don't mean that in a you know a, a, in a way that's kind of tokenistic but truly the cult of rationale skincare is alive and well what compelled you to create a skincare brand i think like a lot of people baha who go into the skincare industry i was motivated by my own skin concerns and i think i've met many dermatologists many scientists like myself many therapists who are solely motivated by their own skin concerns and wanting answers and then wanting to be able to help other people once you've found those answers. So it was very much a personal journey. Uh, I think, you know, as a young man, I was in my mid twenties and I had still had acne, which I thought was a teenage problem. I was a competitive swimmer. So I was in the sun all the time. I grew up in, in the sun on the South coast of New South Wales, had a lot of sun damage. And I thought I'm 25. I look at least 35 and I've still got acne. This is not, this is not okay. And I think that became my sole motivation. And to this day, I have an incredible empathy for people who have acne, especially adult acne, which is very it's frustrating. Huge topic. We, we huge actually, topic. we did cover it in our first issue of Ageless because surprisingly it's, it's one of the most aging and um, biggest it's concern. <laughs> Mm, it's very difficult and of course sun damage which virtually every Australian faces um, so I think they were my two platforms for wanting to be in, in the skincare industry and to start uh, you know a philosophy I guess of rationale as opposed to just making products but that's where our name comes from rationale it's the scientific reason why we do something and I wanted there to be that scientific rationale for every rationale product and every rationale ritual Richard, one of the things that I love about the work that you've done and the research behind your creations is the study of genetics and epigenetics. Um, and I'd love for you to share your philosophy of um, learning from these key pillars in mm. um, understanding skin and physiology and, um, and then going into a laboratory with mm. this knowledge at hand and then creating products with these pillars in mind? Mm, sure. Well, when I was a young scientist just training, we were taught about skin genetics. And of course, we all know genetics is the inherited characteristics that we, we acquire from our parents. And when I was trained, we were taught that uh, skin genetics were immutable, they were unchangeable. You were given a, a set of blueprints by both parents, and that was going to be your skin's destiny. And in my case, that wasn't such a good picture. So I, I wasn't born with good skin genes. I had my mother's propensity to skin cancer and sun damage because she was very fair. And I had my father's acne gene. So I had both a double whammy, if you like. And I was taught, well, that's just your lot. That's what you're going to have to live with. And it wasn't a very optimistic or a very promising picture. But over the last 20 years, Baha, we have seen the absolute dominance of the epigenetic theory. And the epigenetic theory is full of hope and it's full of personal power. Because what epigenetics has taught us that is that sitting above that genetic code that is, it does come from both parents, is what's called the epigenetic code. And epigenetics are like a series of on-off switches that we, through our behaviors, habits, formulations that we use, diet, exercise, all these in, uh, contributing factors, we are able to manipulate whether that gene for 
sun damage, skin cancer, or even acne, whether that gets activated. So I just, to me, it just, that was right at the start of us starting to um, be, be very strong with our philosophy with rationale. We knew what we stood for. And then there was this incredible light at the end of the tunnel that said, no, your, your health and beauty is very much in your hands. So it was such an um, a, a epiphany for me to see that, no, I'm not a victim of my genes. And neither are you and neither is any, anyone on this planet. We have a very, very large say in what happens to our health and beauty. And that's, I guess, the philosophy that rationale is, is built on. That what I find you do that so interesting makes... because, you know, you are a, a private laboratory um, and, you know, you, you've developed this brand yourself. And yet I see the R&D and I, my background is I've worked for some of the biggest brands in the world my, myself. And I've, I've been to the laboratories of some of the biggest mm -hmm. brands in the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I was always, you know, I, I was in my 20s when I did that. And I used to always think when I was doing a laboratory tour mm -hmm. that, you know, who gets to be the groundbreaking scientist? Mm -hmm. What theory is the most correct? Mm -hmm. And so... Mm -hmm. Uh, I worked for a company that had multiple brands and there was a deep competition between the brands and the laboratories were really very much church and state. There was no crossover. And I remember, you know, hearing from one scientist or one R&D team where, you know, they put all of their eggs into one um, scientific theory and then another team who, who had gone the other way. And I remember thinking, you know, where is the confluence of agreement and and who's who's right? And so when I was learning about personalized skincare, which I think is really the future of of skincare, and I I'm so excited by you know um, genetic testing and then prescription. I, I think that it's just such an exciting path. But then mm -hmm. you know when I read about what you've been doing with Rationale, yeah, it made sense to me. Yes, yes, I, I think. The, the beauty of genetic testing is that I understand there's an inherent fear. People think, you know, am I going to discover something terrible or, you know, I've got cancer, or I'm going to get cancer. But I, I think we've seen over the last 10 years with genetic testing that it actually is incredibly empowering. And rather than it being a source of fear, it's a source of power and um, proactivity for people because once you know what your genetic code is going to do, for you or against you, you're able to intervene and introduce all of those epigenetic um, factors that will determine whether or not you know this, this is going to happen to you. And that goes in every area of medicine. It's not just dermatology. I mean, I know psychiatrists who are very active in this area of, of brain health, not just mental health, which is our emotional state. Absolutely. Actual health of the brain, you know, and that's epigenetically under our control as well, we now know. So I, I think that there's great hope in this story, Baha. And I think coming back to what you were talking about with, with research in the cosmetic science field, Rationale's never been driven by marketing. We didn't have a I didn't have a concept of what a marketing department was for many, many, many years. And when we did introduce a marketing team, it was very much about education rather than, oh, let's create a pretty story or a trendy on-trend story. So rationale is not driven by trends or fads or, you know, we look at human skin and its optimal state of health and beauty, what goes wrong, which is largely a small percent genetic and a large percent environmental. Absolutely. And then what do we have to put back to get the skin back to that level of health and beauty that where it was before? So, so it's can I ask you, can I ask you um, what, what's essential and what isn't? Because, you, mm -hmm. you know, you've now got all of this study and, you know, yeah. you've got the luxury and also the benefit of working in one of the harshest environments in the world for your studies. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think in a skincare range or regimen, what's essential and what can we live without? Yes, yeah. Well, I think maybe about 15 years ago, I started to form this concept of what we now call the essential six. Yes, so, yes, that's right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm like everyone else. I'm lazy with my skincare. And if I could do everything in one step, I would, but we can't. So it's like fitness, you know, you've got to have uh, some um, aerobic strength, some um, muscular strength, uh, some flexibility, all those things going to make good health. It's the same with the skin. And we also liken it to a good diet. A healthy diet has a good balance of, you know, vitamins, minerals, fiber, 
proteins um, and carbohydrates. So we need all the right elements in the right combinations at the right times to have optimal health. So these studies sort of parallel each other. And I think with human skin, they're essentially, we worked out there are six things that you need to have healthy glowing skin the rest of your life. Your skin has an immune system. So we've got to protect the skin's immune system. The skin has an antioxidant system and we have to do everything we can to fortify that because it diminishes with age and environmental damage. We have to protect the skin from the environment. 80% of what we now know as skin aging is caused by the sun alone. So we need Absolutely. to have good solar protection repair strategies. I think at night we have to repair the skin's barrier. That's invaluable. Uh, I think the changes in the skin's pH um, occur over time each decade of life and as a result of environmental damage. So we've got to rebalance the skin's pH. And then we've got to try and repair any cellular damage that's occurred just metabolically or as a result of the environment as well. So I think those six, um, we call them collections, but they also are, I guess, pillars or, or foundations of skin health. I think if anyone's serious about taking care of their skin, they will address each one of those pillars uh, in a morning and nighttime uh, ritual or regime. I, I'm interested in um, this essential six concept because there has been such an explosion of mm. the culture of layering specific yeah. ingredients. And a lot of mm. brands have come out with mono ingredient claims and mono. So to me, I'm, I'm interested to know, how do you uh, determine, um, I guess, the formulations and and the mm. um, the actives that mm. go into treating those essential six uh, pillars uh, that in a safe and efficacious way and also, you know, pr prevents us from having to use 20 different serums, which is yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah, it is. It is crazy. I, I, again, I, believe it or not, I'm a minimalist. I think that, you know, that we need to do what needs to be done and nothing more. Mm -hmm. But I think each one of those steps represents something that's found naturally in human skin. So I've always said human skin is my research library and my guiding light. You know, if I want the answers, I look at human skin. What does it do in a state of optimal health and beauty? What's gone wrong? And what do I have to do to repair that damage or restore health and beauty to the skin? So uh, unfortunately, I think in the last I don't know, three to five years, there's been an explosion of interest by mainstream consumers in cosmeceutical actives. And, you know, every day there's a new brand that, that, that sort of focuses on one active ingredient or, as you say, mono, um, monotherapies. But that's not the way it happens in human skin. You know, take niacinamide, for example. Everyone who's interested in skincare knows about niacinamide and its benefits. And we were the Which very... Which is vitamin very, B. Vitamin B3, yes. Yeah. And we were the very first Australian, the very first company worldwide um, to incorporate not just vitamin B3, but the B group vitamins into that first immune protection step. Why? Because vitamin B3 doesn't exist by itself in human skin. In fact, it can't function optimally by itself in human skin. All of the other B group vitamins are there because they're essential human nutrients and they're found in human skin. So I find this trend of mono ingredients or hero products yes. quite worrying. And so it's akin to saying people just eat fats and you'll be healthy. Or just we eat were color. talking about that before because there are so many crazy diet um, trends. Yes. Yes. And I always say by heart, and that applies to all of the six steps. So the antioxidants in human skin, vitamin C is not existing in a vacuum by itself. It has to be with vitamin A and vitamin E and a whole bunch of enzymes and minerals to be optimally functional in the skin. And yet when you go online, even now you see thousands of vitamin C serums, but they tend to cause irritation. Why? Because that's not how it happens in human skin. It's not about having a huge dose of vitamin C. It's about having vitamin C in the right dose with all its other antioxidants that are found naturally in human skin so it can do its job. I so find that so of... interesting. And I, I, I kind of, you know, when I get sent press kits or I get sent products mm -hmm. or I speak to people and get DMs about, you know, uh, which exactly vitamin c or which vitamin b should i use and and there is such a uh, variance in the efficacy of the of um the do you know it's really interesting i used rationale i want to say about 
six or seven years ago was the first time I was introduced to the brand. And I was put on the Essential Six by a clinic, um, by an excellent clinic, actually. And um, one of the things that I thought, and I'll share this with you completely candidly, is that the products weren't strong enough because oh, I was used to that aggressive, yeah. aggressive vitamin yeah. A that strips you bare yeah. and you peel mm-hmm. like a snake. A vitamin mm-hmm. C, I was looking for a vitamin C that irritated my skin because yes. it didn't feel like it was vitamin C if it wasn't yeah. irritating my skin. And yeah. I remember um, when I first started using it, I was like, is this really going to work? It just, it's not stinging. It's a pleasure. It smells wonderful. Uh, It feels like a luxury brand. And if funnily enough, for all of those reasons, I was like, "Mm, I don't know about this. But I've I've heard this before, but it's not an unusual expression, particularly amongst people who are either in our industry or very highly educated themselves about cosmeceuticals and cosmeceutical actives and skin health. Well, I must have been a dunce to like expect those things because... Truly, six, six, seven weeks after being on the Rational Program, it, there was a glow. There's a, there's, yes. a, there's a very unique softness to the skin, I would like to say. There's yeah. a, um, I don't know a better word. There's a filtered quality to the skin. And, yeah. I, and I, I'm going to be um, a bit controversial here. I would call mm. it the rich girl skin. I always yeah. say, no, seriously. Yeah, that too. I love that. Yeah. It's rich. It's, I- it's kind of a rich girl skin. And if you walk around, yeah. I, you know, I live in Sydney in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, you yes. can tell who was a rationale girl because they have Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and we watch TV. You can see the newsreaders and journalists who use rationale. It's very, and celebrities, which is very interesting too because they have their own, um, they have their own issues, I guess, of self-esteem and being constantly in the public eye. And so I think, yeah, it, it's such an interesting thing, isn't it, that people um, almost um, were conditioned. And I think the medical profession had to a big learning there in that something doesn't have to, you know, there's a saying in medicine, if it doesn't cut, burn or poison, it doesn't work. <laughs> and I, I think that's a dangerous assumption when it comes to daily skin health. I always think Western medicine is at its best when things are at their worst, mm-hmm. but on a day-to-day level of skin health, it's just like fitness. If you go to a trainer and they say to you, right, you're gonna do 500 crunches and 500 push-ups, you're going to be so injured and so damaged. you're not going to come back you may feel self-righteous but you are physically unable to come back and continue and sustain that so for me you know we we have a um I guess a saying at rationale and that is that we're about luminous skin for life and we mean for life for living but also for your entire life and to do that it's a long game uh, and it, it takes commitment um, it's like raising a child. You know, you've got to think in 20-year blocks. And I think with your skin, you've got to think in at least 10-year blocks. And, and I think our clients are very aware that it's that day-by-day discipline and commitment to the ritual of self-care rather than quick fixes or abusive behaviours, you know, harming or damaging your skin. Well, it's interesting you should say that because... Um as I said, when we met, I was consulting to Le Petit Saint and All Saints Clinic. And, you know, Dr. Joseph is one of my favorite people in the world. And I credit him for, you know, keeping the hands of time at bay for me. I I love him so much. But um, when I was speaking to all the uh, dermal nurses and the clinicians and, uh, and the team, their mm. love uh, for your brand was so palpable. It was almost like an addiction. And when I ask them why the interesting thing that they said is we know that if we prescribe rationale to our clients they'll use it and they'll enjoy it so pleasure yes. and compliance was at an yes. all-time high with a brand that mm. was enjoyable and gave results and they mm. said you know we can do everything we want to do here they can have laser they can have filler they can have botox they can have any manner of treatment, but if the home care mm. isn't sophisticated, if yes. the client doesn't stick to the home care, if they're not dedicated for the long haul, it's mm. just a patch job. And actually, ultimately, they blame the clinic for yes. not giving a result. So not giving a result, yes. So it's interesting but, because it's not just your clients who love you, but it's also skin professionals who say, you know what, I'm I'm happier to uh, go with a brand that I know will be loved and will be used faithfully, as you said. 
Yes. And it's a long-term uh, commitment. There, it is a long-term commitment. And I've always believed, Baha, that efficacy is only first base, you know, and that's hard enough to achieve. You know, what the, where the real gold was, and what I think why Rationale has developed this worldwide following, is that the, the elegance of the formulation is just as important, which is almost scientific heresy, but it's absolutely true. I if agree. Love something, they will repeat it. If the formulation not only makes you look beautiful, but make, it creates an immediate visual beauty to the skin, they're going to love it. So for me, it's all about compliance. I think we humans are ritualistic. We love rituals. It's, it's hardwired in our brain. I agree. And we know that rituals are habit-based. So it's a bit like you know, having, going and have, having your face lasered. It's like going to boot camp. You can go to boot camp once a year or twice a year, but if you don't follow up with that daily training with your personal trainer or by yourself in the gym, you are not going to see results. And, and so it's exactly as you said. Can I ask you something? Do you think it's ever too late to undo damage using skincare? No, not at all. One of the most beautiful things, and my dear, dear friend, Belinda Welsh, she's an outstanding dermatologist. I know, Dr. Belinda she's Welsh, gorgeous. yes. She really is the, the perfect modern dermatologist you know she, she she's a medical dermatologist. we actually featured her in um oh bravo place. yes yes we did in she our first issue she's of wonderful the well belinda always said to me the beautiful thing about human skin and working as a medical practitioner in skin is that you can see if something's working now, if we take a supplement for our, our liver or the heart or the brain, you can't see whether it's working. But with skin, you can see if it's working or not. So that's the beautiful thing. And the other thing she said was, the wonderful thing about skin too is that you can bring it back to health most of the time, which is wonderful. And not the case with other organs of the body too. So the skin has an incredibly forgiving capacity to heal and to return to states of health if you do the right things. I can speak from experience and I've banged on about this in nearly every episode. I'm 47 now, but I can hand on heart say this is the best skin of my life. I look younger than at 37 because my skin quality is better. The yes. luminosity is luminosity, infinitely better. Tone. You know, all all of those things. Looking at you on camera, your skin is beautiful. And it's my you know, hobby, Richard. It well, is my you, hobby. Some people amazing. have other addictions, but my skin is my hobby. <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting you ask about is it ever too late? Because my philosophy is you, a woman can look beautiful, a woman can't look young forever. And I think the trouble we have in cosmetic medicine is chasing youth yes, I and agree. trying to do whatever we can to look young. So my philosophy is you can't look young forever, but you can be beautiful at any age. Yeah, I agree. Can I ask you something though? Let's talk about men. And I would like to, we yeah. talked about elegance and to me, you are the personification of elegance. You, oh, you, really, you really bring... Um, that old Hollywood glamour. And I, I, I say this to Dr. Joseph as well. Like to me, he he's like a movie star. Yes, he and, is. And, and I think that that's part of the pleasure of being a client of all saints. And I think yeah. it's part of the pleasure of being, you know, a, a cult follower of rationale is that it, it is the return to elegance and, um, and living, walking your talk. Tell me about mm. your rituals your own personal rituals to remain ageless your vitality rituals your diet and well-being rituals what do you do yeah, sure sure well i think firstly I, I think you've got to look after the mind you've got to look after the body and you've got to look after the skin and i think those three things if you take care of those three things you're pretty much in good shape you know so in terms of the mind i meditate every day so I, I use what format uh, do you do? I use an I use a, an app called Brainwave that was developed um, uh, for for the astronaut in the astronaut program, and it allows them to bring down their heart rate to calm their brain waves and be in a, a, a state of alert awareness. So um, I love Brainwave because you can select where you want to be. You can you can dial up focused attention, um, deep sleep, wake up. You, you can have all these uh, programs that you can access that bring the brain level of brain activity exactly where you need to go to achieve that directly. It's wonderful. 
So I use that to meditate. And in terms of the body, I train with my personal trainer, um, Yago Aldir at Project Better every day of the week. I rest on the Every weekend. day, I love every that. Every day, I, I try to exercise. It's different things because the body has to rest in between, of course. But I have that combination of strength training, flexibility and aerobic capacity, trying to get that balance right. Can I ask um, you how yeah. old you are, Richard? I'm 61. Wow. Yeah. And, and do, do you I feel do. better now than you have in previous oh, lifetimes? Mentally, absolutely, yes. Physically, I think if I'm completely honest, that the, you know, we age. And there are things that you I have to pay attention to now that I didn't at 30 or 40 or even 50. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, but the, I, I find that awareness a blessing, Baha, because your body tells you what it needs. You know, if you're feeling stiff, you need to do more work on your flexibility. The body doesn't, it's not cruel. It, it does tell you, I need this. You know, do you do any lasers? Do you do any aesthetic treatment? Have you had I, I suffer from rosacea. So um, once or sometimes twice a year, depending on the year, I go and see Dr. Welsh to have um, some laser work done on my rosacea. Um, but apart from that, no, I just use the Rational Essential 6 every day, my three in the morning, my three at night, and that's personalised to me. I have my own therapist at Rational. Everyone at Rational has what we call a skin mentor. So everyone in the company, the research team, the, the education the marketing team, the warehouse team, everyone has a therapist who looks after their skin and the therapists themselves have someone that looks after them. And I think that accountability is really important. And I go to my therapist once a month and I have my rationale treatment and she tells me which products I need and I buy them myself. I pay for them because I think if you pay for something, you value it. And I want the girls to see I value their advice. So um, that's an important part of um, my skincare ritual. But I, I do believe that habits are very, very important. I, I trained as a classical musician before I became a, a scientist in skincare and um, the most important thing I learned, I learned two important lessons, I think. One is that infinite creativity comes from daily discipline. So the, the, the more I instigated that daily ritual of practice, either in cello and the piano, the more creative I was able to be. The other thing I learned was that technique sets you free, it's liberating. So rather than being a bind, practicing scales and arpeggios and so on, those things set me free. And I, the, I have carried that lesson through from childhood into my work as a skincare scientist. So I know the more disciplined I am about the research and the technique of creating the, the, the formulations, the more creative I can actually be in, in that arena. So I, I think that lesson's invaluable and applies to every discipline in life. I know that you as a company uh, support the Australian Ballet and I, in all of the interviews that I've done with like really the most powerful themes that have come through is exactly as you were saying before, that 360 approach to longevity and vitality with creativity and the arts and that nourishment of soul being a huge part of the ageless conversation. Um, do, do you agree that that's part of the thing that keeps you young? Yes, I, I think it is. And it keeps us human too, you know. It, what, what's interesting about all of this is that we talked before about humans are ritualistic and that's hardwired into us. But also what's hardwired into the brain is the, is the imperative to create, you know, amongst all mammals, only humans make music, make art, write poetry, you know, dance. So all of those things, those rituals, I think are incredibly important to being human. I do and, too. And I think like the most youthful, you know, and, and you watch children. I have an 11 year old and I, you know, the friendship bubble has opened dur during this lockdown. And oh, so That's I had a friend, she had a friend over and it was really interesting to see what they chose to do with this, yeah. you know, what final do? opportunity. It was dancing. Yep. It was singing, it yes. was laughing, it was yes. drawing, it was drawing. art Very and creative. They, yes. it, it was such a natural self-expression of the human spirit. Yes. And when, when I speak to people who are creators, such as yourself, and who are really a long way on their ageless journey, that mm. creativity thing should not be underestimated. The, no. the, the joy and of the art. It shouldn't go away. It shouldn't go away. And the wonderful thing is that there's infinite capacity to express it. 
you know, from, from you know, going and doing a dance workout class, doing ballroom dancing or salsa with your partner or, you know, there, there's infinite variety in human creativity. The one thing I know for sure is that we're hardwired to do it and we're happier when we express that part of ourselves. And it, it's got nothing to do with age. It is truly ageless. Yes, it definitely is. Tell me about supplementation and diet. Do you, we were talking about the craziness of diet fat, yeah. but do you, do you take supplementations? Do you have IV treatments? What kind mm. of diet uh, do you follow? Mm -hmm. I, I, with diet, I'm very much a, a meta-analysis person. I, I think there are so many fad diets and I've probably tried them all. Um, and I do, but I do think from, from, a, from surveying hundreds of articles and from looking literally at thousands of research studies, there are certain things that seem to be true for everyone. The, the one that I, I'll mention above everything else is there is not a doctor or a healthcare practitioner on this planet that will say that sugar is good for you. Yes, that's true. Yeah, so I'm pretty, you know, and the I inflammation am, conversation is one just we could do a whole episode just on inflammation. Oh, we could. And there are so many fads, you know, low carbs, low fats, like, you know, so many diet fads. But what seems to be um, realistic is cut out or try to eliminate as much as possible, possible sugar, try to eat the right balance of proteins, carbohydrates, fiber, minerals, vitamins, and so on. Um, and, and try to eliminate or try not to be overrepresented in any one particular area, you know, so, uh, so I, I, try, I sort of have a middle of the ground approach. Um, but I do think eliminating sugar, I mean, I was raised on sugar, like most children of my generation. And um, it's difficult. I find that very difficult. Because to me, you know, so much of food baha, I think is compensatory to people, I'm stressed, or I've done, you know, I need you know, comfort. And I understand that. But I think the long term consequences of what we are now starting to understand and but again, epigenetically, you can change your body's responses to food by what you put in it. So it, it's not it's not ever a lost cause. In terms of supplements, um, I do believe in things. Uh, I take ascorbic acid, um, particularly if I'm not feeling well, or I feel, you know, I might be getting a cold or something like that. I'm convinced that the vitamin C and zinc work. In terms of other supplements, I've tried many, and I haven't, to be honest, I haven't felt a huge difference in them but again it's difficult to know what's going on inside the body compared to the skin where you can see if something's working or not absolutely now you talk we talked about the essential six and uh, we talked about your but what is next so uh, we talked about what's essential and what's superfluous but do you do you believe that there are some add-ons to the essential six and to those key pillars uh, of yes. effective anti-aging treatments that we can do that you yes. recommend and you you're working on. I'd love to know what you're working on. I know yeah, everyone would ask you that. <laughs> it's my pleasure. So I, I think when we started, with the first essential six was literally six products. But as we expanded and you see more skin types, and of course in my lifetime, Australia's become far more multicultural. So I have seen a lot more skin types for which that particular expression of the essential six wasn't appropriate. So we have had to expand beyond six products to six categories. So the six categories, as I mentioned, are immune protection, antioxidant protection, solar protection, uh, barrier repair, pH repair, and cellular repair. And within those six categories or collections, we like to call them, we now have alternatives based on different skin types, different skin ages, different levels of skin sensitivity. And the most interesting one that's driving research right now is as rationales uh, expanding globally. So we've just opened our first two uh, flagship clinics in Singapore during the pandemic. And we have learned so much about what I call, it's a concept that I've been constructing these past few months called geocentricity. So ge that. geocentricity- There is so is much that. interest in this, absolutely. Yeah, well, where you are on the planet determines um, your skin's responses to it. And we have to consider that. If you live in an equatorial, hot, humid climate, sunny all the time, your skin's gonna have very different responses to someone that lives in, you know, in Iceland. So, and and if you live in Beijing with that level of pollution, it's a completely oh, different pollution is a huge epigenetic, an epigenetic mm. concern you have to attend to. Exactly. Exactly. So all of our research now is driven by the looking at the geocentric um, uh, needs of, of clients globally. 
I love so that. Oh, gosh. And do you find that, going back to your comment about uh, the multi-ethnicity of Australia, um, yeah. and I, I get questions on this all the time because mm. you're absolutely correct you know different our genetics um definitely dictate you know our oil production our propensity absolutely. for acne our propensity for pigmentation, pigmentation. Mm. yes well of course a uh, scarring yeah. even you know yes how we scar what it looks like all of that so mm. it, when you were developing you know the brand and as you look at uh, developing products for the brand and and I guess for the consumer who's listening to this what are some guidelines that you can assist them with you know obviously outside of just the world of rationale when they're yeah. making those decisions and investments in treatment products uh, mm. questions they should be asking mm. I, I think the most important thing of all is accurate diagnosis so our teams at Rationale are trained, then they're not doctors. So what that, but what they are trained to do is to know when something needs medical referral. So rather than say, oh yeah, we can treat your pigmentation or you know, some pigmentation we can be very effective with. But if you have really recalcitrant um, um, rosacea or um, melasma, you need medical attention. So a, a very unique part of our, our rationale uh, universe, I guess, is that we have we are the conduit between medicine and beauty. So someone might come to us and thinking they have a cosmetic problem like melasma, we say, well, actually it's a medical condition and it's treatable, but not by us. You, you know, you need to go and see a dermatologist or a physician to have th that treated. So, and, and then but the beautiful thing is Baha that once and this is where we've been important in the medical field, I think we've made major advances. Traditional medicine, once you've been treated for something, you drop off the radar. You know, when the medication stops, that's it, you're on your own. Whereas there's this beautiful harmony between rationale and, and our, our physicians where they hand them back to us. You know, now that we've treated your melasma or your rosacea with medications or lasers or whatever it may be, we entrust you to Rationale's care to, to maintain luminous skin for life. And there is that beautiful uh, cross uh, uh, referral that happens for us. So that's the first thing. I think consultation diagnosis is critical. You've got to know what, you, what you're looking at and, and often consumers don't. You know, to consumers, it's red and it's itchy. Well, that could be one of 10,000 disorders. It's brown, it's pigmented. That could be one of a thousand pigmentary disorders. And we're not trained to do that, but our doctors are. Right. And that's the beauty of, of, that, of that network that we, we've built up so faithfully over so many years. Uh, I think that's important. And then I think it comes down to looking at what we can do to help. And that is create formulations that are beautiful to use, efficacious, and that people will use it, um, every single day in order to get the result. And to so wrap it up, I, I mean, yeah. I don't want to wrap it up. I have, like, I literally have 20 more questions for you, and this could oh. go on for hours. Uh, but I do want to ask you, what do you see as the future of skincare? You know, as we move away from this mono ingredient yeah. or um, this marriage of cosmeceutical, and as you said, that uh, overall well-being conversation. What, where do you see skincare going in your laboratories and in, in the research you're doing? I, I think the most valuable um, contribution I may have made to skincare and where I believe the future is going is empowering the consumer. Because when people know their own skin bar, they know what they need and they know what they don't need. They know what's real and they know what's just marketing hype. So I, I think that old cliche knowledge is power is so true. So I see the future in skincare being empowerment and a growing knowledge base and education of, of the consumer. I think that's the most important thing and the most, and that's the thing that I'm hell bent on trying to be influential in making it happen. I want people to understand their skin at a genetic level. So even if they don't use rationale, they know their skin and they know what it needs and what it doesn't need. So I think that's going to be the future. And I also think the third thing is this concept of geocentricity because humans now are globally mobile. And I think if you are born with a genetic code that might give you no problems at all if you're living in Malaysia or you're living in Spain, or you're living in Turkey. But if you move to Melbourne, for example, or Sydney, or you know, London, that's, everything's going to change. So understanding the effects of geocentricity on skin health, I believe will be the third most important uh, direction in skincare. Oh gosh, well, I, I have absolutely loved learning from you. I knew I would, I knew, 
Oh, it's such a it's such a breath of fresh air, and I just want to thank you so much for giving me oh, some of your time and to share and for sharing some of your future forecasting. You know, in the mysterious but beautiful and exciting world of uh, cosmeceuticals and skincare, I can't wait to have you back um, on the show, and I can't wait to see you in real life. Me too, Bahi. You take care, and thank you again for this wonderful opportunity to talk. I've loved every minute. And my warmest regards to you and to all your readers. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please share and rate this episode. I'd love that. 